Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we need a new building. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, we, we, the College of Science and Engineering, for just, just for events like this. Well, thank you all for, for coming today. Um, such a special occasion every time we have a state of the college uh, um, address, gathering and address, and, um, and really appreciate. I'm, I'm really sorry that uh, we don't have enough chairs right now, but uh, we'll try to make this as quick as possible so we can move on. But um, let me, uh, before we, we start, uh, acknowledge and our uh, former dean, Dean Emeritus Steve Crouch, is here with us. Um, our vice president for research, Chris Kramer, here. We happen to have two uh, um, former presidents in our college. I, don't think they're here, but, but anyway, we, we, we uh, certainly w we welcome, um, again, President Kaler fully back into the College of Science and Engineering, and of course, Pre President uh, Emeritus Keller, who, whose name we're, we're here. Um, so um, let me uh, begin by, oh, the other thing is, as you've seen from the announcements for this talk, um, we happen to be fortunate to have President Gable joining us. And my understanding is that she will join us in about 15 minutes. And, and so we will get going and then stop and um, uh, have pre listen to President Gable and then pick up again. So, oh, of course, first of all, thanks to all my colleagues in the dean's office who have made this uh, slide possible. And thanks to you, all the things that you do for the college and for, the, um, for our students. So please join me in thanking yourself and giving yourself a round of applause. So this is the agenda. Uh, we're again going to follow what we did last year, which is uh, look at some numbers. There are too many slides, so I'll be going through them very quickly. The slides will be posted as will be a video of this session. So not to worry about the details. <laughs> uh, I'll point out a few issues. We'll go again through what's been happening on the personnel side, students, research, finance, facilities, recent developments and initiatives in the college, and what's happened with the plan that we talked about last time uh, in growing the college once again. And then hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. All right, by, by the numbers, again, things haven't changed a whole lot. What I can tell you is the takeaway is that the number of faculty this, this fall is, uh, has grown a little bit. It's grown by about 2.5%. It's, as far as I know, it's the largest uh, size. But these things oscillate um, as, as people come and go. And um, the other number that perhaps we've had significant growth is number of research assistants, which is a very good sign. So that's grown by about 6%. This year, staff have gone down a little bit. The student worker numbers are down. So the, the change is really uh, not very much in terms of the total personnel. So that's, that's the story in terms of the overall um, <clears throat> numbers. And this is, again, how things have evolved. As you can see, um, the, um, the, the the staff numbers going down a little bit, the um, instructional staff going up, and to a large extent, uh, really as a result of the <clears throat> increase in instructional needs within computer science uh, and engineering, and, and of course, the uh, RAs, the, the uh, graduate assistant. A lot has happened the past few months, as you know, in terms of leadership change. <clears throat> both within the university and the college. So President Gable started her uh, term on July 1st of this year. And last week, um, we heard that we have a, a new incoming uh, executive vice president and provost, uh, Rachel Croson, who um, some of you, Steve, I think, knows her. I've, I've met her before. Coming here, she, she's a dean of social sciences at Michigan State and economist, and uh, 
she's, she's expected to come on campus in March. And I expect we'll hear more from President Gable about those changes. Within the uh, <clears throat> College of Science and Engineering, we've had the following transitions. Um, Joe Constant, last time when we met, we did not have an associate dean for research, and Joe joined us subsequently. So, related welcome, Joe. <laughs> and we've had uh, three department head transitions. Uh, Sue Mantel uh, started in last January as the head of mechanical engineering. Paul Kroll, um, head of physics and astronomy, uh, as of July 1st, and Brenda Ogle, similarly, as of, as of July, as the head of biomedical engineering. I want to, again, give uh, my appreciation, the appreciation of the college and respective departments to Uwe Kortzhagen for over 10 years as uh, head of mechanical engineering, um, and Ron Poling as head of School of Physics and Astronomy, similarly for two terms, and um, Bob Tranquillo, who um, was the founding head of biomedical engineering and served for nearly 20 years. So thank you again to, to those colleagues. Um, we've had new faculty, of course, and I'll be going through a lot of photos uh, very quickly. As you can see, this just, uh, I'm not going to be spending time on names, but, uh, but you can read them, and you can read them later when you have access to the uh, slides. Um, four in industrial systems engineering, uh, one in the history of science, technology, and medicine, and electrical and computer engineering, earth and environmental sciences, as you can see, mathematics, um, mechanical engineering, physics, and astronomy. So. A uh, good group of colleagues who, who joined us, and we welcomed them at a dean's reception earlier in the fall. Welcome. Um, faculty awards. Um, I know David is here. David, where are you? Here, David Pui. I don't know if Ned is here, but we have two uh, new regents professors uh, in the college. Very proud of that. Um, two PKs award. Winners in, in the college, a significant award, Annabel Bush Faculty Fellowship by Dick James. Um, <clears throat> similarly, six new uh, career award recipients, as you can see, a couple of uh, major uh, early career awards from Department of Energy and, and AFOSR, um, colleagues in chemistry and aerospace engineering mechanics, um, a new McKnight Presidential Chair, Laura Agliardi, as you can see, four distinguished McKnight University professors, McKnight Land Grant professors, and the list goes on. More university awards in our college. Um, we're, of course, very proud of these accomplishments. Morris Alumni um, Award for Outstanding Contributions to Undergraduate Education. Post baccalaureate and graduate edu and professional education, and of course, Maria Gini for service. Congratulations to these colleagues. In terms of uh, collegiate awards, uh, we had two um, research, uh, George Taylor Research Award recipients, uh, service, uh, Edgar. Uh, we'll talk about Edgar again later in the uh, presentation, and the uh, um, <clears throat> Distinguished Teaching Award by Doug Ernie. More awards uh, from, the, from the college, as you can see, the Bowers Faculty Teaching Development, George Taylor, and the Borja Award as well. All right, a few words about what's happened with students. Enrollment is now, this is undergraduate and graduate total, stands at about uh, 8,100, 8,130 to be exact. Students, and we'll come back to this at the end when we talk about the uh, growth of the college. Um, um, so the undergraduate numbers are um, around 5,500, as you can see, um, <clears throat> and uh, about 28, over 28% 28 of um, the undergraduates are women. Uh, graduates over 2,500 with, uh, again, 28% roughly in women and you can see the number of degrees and so forth. 
uh, going back to the freshman class, because this obviously is what was created by the plans for the growth of the college again, and the um, It says fall 2018. Okay. All right. We'll move on. <laughs> Next. But but these are the numbers for 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 this fall, and about 32 percent of the <laughs> class of women. So let me uh, let let me stop here and welcome our president, the 17th president of the <laughs> University of Minnesota. <laughs> John Gable, Evan Gable. Sorry for rushing you no, over, no. but. No, I'm happy. Maybe I don't need this. What do you think? Okay. Being recorded. Yeah, oh, it is being recorded. OK, how's that? Yes. I'm going to um, sing my favorite share tunes to you now. But. <laughs> OK, so hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Moss, uh, for having me, colleagues, uh, for uh, being such great partners and doing so much wonderful work. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very honored to be a part of the State of the College address. I'll keep it short, um, and then maybe we'll have time for some questions. But so I uh, started officially on July 1st, so it hasn't actually been that long. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Only the 17th in 170 years, so I think that says a lot about the institution, um, some of the uh, stability, legacy, and also the fact that uh, people who are in this role like it and have found it to be a, a fulfilling experience, which is not the case everywhere. <laughs> so i um, very honored to be in this position. It's been um, really uh, it's a lot of work to go through the learning curve and transition for something like this, but it's also been a lot of fun. There have been some really wonderful moments along the way, and we'll talk about some of them, but one of the things I want to start with, and, and I think you all know this, but I think it's a reminder when you see statistics like that and all of these thousands of students who come in and come out and the millions of dollars of research that our faculty do and all of the um, aggregate impact that you're, you're seeing reflected in that you'll hear more about is when I'm out and about, people come up to me you know, with tears in their eyes saying, I'm a fifth generation gopher, or you invented something that saved my farm, you invented something that saved my life. I, I mean, literally everywhere I go, that's what I hear. And uh, that's person by person impact or family by family impact. And so there's a lot of humanity in this work that uh, is incredibly, um, on, it's an honor to be a part of. And that's what, I'm just there shaking their hand and thanking them. I didn't do a thing of it, you all did that. And so I'm very grateful for what that means, both for the legacy of what I'm entering into personally, but also what it means and the optimism it, it gives me about the future and what the university is continuing to do and how you know, 170 years from now and the 34th president might be describing this era in the university's life and the impact that the university's been doing. So that's been a really wonderful experience. Now, I mean, there are a couple of people who come up to me and complain about things too, but we won't talk about that. So it's not as much fun. Um, we have been very actively doing system level strategic planning, which is a very interesting, I'll call it an exercise, although exercise makes it sound hypothetical, but and it's very real. But it's an exercise largely because as a system, we're an incredibly chaotic thing, right? So we're five campuses. Um, we have uh, you know, over a dozen colleges. Duluth has three. There are different departments on the other campuses. Rochester has 500 students. We have 55,000. Um, it is a very strange thing to find a directional correctness, um, an aspirational set of targets that make sense for all of that. But I'm lucky because I'm the beneficiary of a couple of years of really good consultative work that happened before I got here, done by Rebecca Ropers, who many of you know is vice provost, one of the vice provosts, and Stephen Lemkul, who was the chancellor at Rochester at the time. And they did literally thousands of interviews, two retreats, and came up with what they were calling strategic intentions, but were by many vocabularies, value statements, things that were around our systemness, that were um, 
unique and interesting and maybe perhaps executed upon in different ways within different units of the system, but were shared in the desire for them to be or to occur or to improve. And that was brought to the board who said, okay, this is great, but now what are the action steps and how will we measure it in the way that boards like to do? So now my chat task is to take those values and turn them into action. The intersection between values and action across the system, we're calling those commitments. And the commitments are in some ways pretty um, obvious. We commit to students and their success. We commit to discovery and innovation and the impact of that discovery and innovation. We commit to being inclusive and creating a sense of welcoming and belonging. We commit to being good stewards of our money as a public institution. So students, research, inclusion, and money are the first four, and they're kind of obvious. And if you put your hand over the logo, every university has those commitments in one form or another. There will be some distinction in the execution, but the real distinction and what we were really charged to do, and I think many of you can relate to this, particularly in the areas of excellence represented in this college, is that we wanted to do things that would only happen at the university of Minnesota or things that represent our distinction. And, w and that was very interesting to try and articulate across the system where each campus is itself distinct. Um, and so we were looking at things that really were inspired by the state of Minnesota that are of depth or robustness here, either because of the industries that are here or the topography or some of the legacy um, events of the state and where we have depth of strength in the faculty across the system or in student interest to amplify accelerate, mitigate, solve, as the case may be, these robust issues that emerge out of Minnesota. And we're calling that intersection mintersections. I'm looking for the eye rolls, all right? So in questions inspired by the state that we are uniquely positioned to answer at world-class levels. And that bridge between being in a sense of place as the University of Minnesota and also being world-class, I don't think anybody does that better than us and um, or is in a position to do it better than us. And so for the arc of this strategic plan, which is you know five years, give or take, and we're already in year one for all intents and purposes, we see those intersections as orbiting around health, food, and the environment, but not at the expense of other things. Obviously, none of that happens without strength in technology, strength in data and informatics. We're still working actively on things like the attainment gap, which is a uniquely strong, robust problem in the state of Minnesota, but things that are system-wide, that are inspired by the state, that we have unique ability to um, offer uh, improvement to, are for this arc, health, food, and the environment. So that's the fifth commitment, the intersection commitment. As a sidecar to the strategic planning process, we're working on student mental health, many of you have heard about this in the media. We are right in the middle of the national averages with our own student population, which means a lot of our students have mental health challenges. Um, we meet students where they are in general, but in particular in things that can affect their ability to learn and be successful, and this is at the top of that list these days. So we're very focused on being thought leaders around providing sufficient services, helping them learn how to be their own advocate or um, center of support and also doing things outside of clinical care that sometimes can just help with things that are perhaps not at the level require requiring counseling but can still be a barrier to happiness and success. Not the least of which is, this is my one of my favorites, so one of my favorite programs is the PAUSE program with the dogs, you know, and all the data around how soothing that is. Do you know we have therapy chickens? <laughs> Everyone knew that but me. I, I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> I have to admit, chickens don't exactly alleviate my stress, but I'm glad they do for someone else. That's what I hear. I just haven't, I, I, I need to experience it, the magical stress chicken. But um, we also have two big searches going. The first is the provost, which is, of course, ar arguably the biggest hire I will make. Um, and we've just announced her name is Rachel Cross and Chris Kramer co-chaired that search. Thank you, Chris, for the many things that he does um, and that all of you do in making something like this work well. Uh, one of the main things she described um, when we were interviewing was the engagement when she was on campus. You know, 
and that's not always the case. So very grateful for that. So her name is Rachel Croson. She comes to us from Michigan State. She's Dean of Social Sciences there. She is a behavioral economist, Harvard-trained behavioral economist, um, and a, a lovely human being with a really good sense of humor, which is not to be underestimated in some of the long days you know, that we put in, for me personally anyway, <laughs> working side by side, and I think for all of us across academic affairs. So we're very delighted to have had such a successful search, and we're very close on our VP for HR, uh, hopefully, hopefully um, getting over the finish line on that too. So that's my news of the day, uh, with great appreciation for all that you do. And do you want to do questions for a few minutes? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to run before, oh, okay. <laughs> never mind, so yes. So as far as I know, um, the state uh, under Governor Waltz is thinking of a strategic <coughs> plan which should put Minnesota onto a trajectory to be carbon free by 2050. So that has a large component of research and development into energy. Is that included in the environment? I think so. I mean, this is the beauty of where I sit with the strategic. So I have heard the same thing, although they have not formally articulated um, this plan, but there are rumblings. Um, uh, so I would call it a, a, a substantive rumor at this point, but a good rumor. I think uh, very few people would disagree with the value in this kind of initiative. And even if it wasn't formally articulated with a deadline, there's no question that the state administration right now wants to be a better, uh, wants to be better, um, broadly speaking. So um, the, the, the beauty of, of strategic planning, at least for me personally, and my role in it is I'm, I see my job as um, developing clay that gets put on the wheel with, with the, and I say it generally needs to be a bowl. And then we go through the consultative process, right? And so I'm, you know, there's a lot that I articulate as the starting point for the conversation, but where we get into exact points of execution or what we would choose to measure as an outcome of a successful planning process, we'll loop through that. But it's hard to imagine uh, if the governor did something like that and put resources behind that, that with everything that we have going on on this campus, that we wouldn't be the first in line to be the, the thought partners on what that might look like. And I can think of a variety of structures. Whether Even if we had nothing about the environment in a strategic plan, we would still all do that. I mean, those of us who work in that area, either in policy, the science, or in leadership. So thank you. Anything else? Sure. Yes. So, hi. hi. So, a as a college, we're remarkably proud of the strength of the students we're able to bring in as here. You we're, be. Yes. we're selective. As a university, we have an amazing diversity of programs that are highly accessible at a variety of levels, programs that are highly selective. How do we, in the context of a, a system wide strategic direction, Make sure that that's a strength and not a weakness that leads to, you know, internal lack of cohesion or competition. That's a really good question. I would say that's right on the line between challenge and opportunity. <laughs> sort of like people say hate and love is kind of the same thing. Um, because we have that challenge across the Twin Cities campus, but let's roll in the system campuses, which are experiencing the national trend on um, system campus enrollment, which means they're down, um, except for Rochester, which is only 500 students. Uh, but if they, if they go down four or five students, it's very high impact for them. And we have quite a bit of variance, Some, most of you know this, but I will just say it as part of the response, across this campus with um, enrollment and demand. Uh, this college, of course, having tremendous demand um, for very good reasons, and other programs that are in cycles. And you all who've been doing this long enough have experienced some of those cycles over the years. So it varies um, according to time and demand and what's going on in society and in the world. And, you know, I was a business school dean myself, and I remember when uh, one of the Wall Street bubbles came and went, no one majored in finance because. There were no jobs on Wall Street, and now finance is out the door, and that will be the case for a cycle, and it will come and go. Um, system enrollment strategy 
enrollment management strategy is one of the least scintillating things that we do <laughs> talk about, um, but it is so critically important. And mm -hmm. it is something that we have, um, I don't want to say struggled with, but it's not like we have it humming either. And um, part of the problem with that is that the number of high school graduates is declining. So there are certain things you can do in a marketplace where there is sufficient demand, and I hate to think of students as demand, but just for the purposes of the conversation. And then it changes entirely when your, your headcount is simply going down nationally and what that means. And so I think there is a combination of just simply good storytelling so that the, the advantages of programs is done well We've gotten a lot better at that, and we still have some work to do. There is some strategy around how to engage um, using data in attracting students. And then there's probably some right-sizing, which is one of the hardest things that we talk about, which is to think about where the number of students is really likely to be and getting to that <laughs> size um, <coughs> where appropriate um, in ways that aren't overly painful or fundamentally change who you are. And w everyone will be doing some version of that across the country. That's how you keep from being one of the schools that closes, which <coughs> is would be the worst possible outcome. So it's a multifaceted approach. Susan Gable, thank you so much. Thank for you all very much. Very glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, you heard it. So the demand uh, for this college is high, as we were talking about, and we've tried to respond to that, and we'll come to, back to uh, that issue with the growth plan towards the end of the uh, presentation. Um, this is again is just an updated graph um, that, that shows uh, over the years how the um, number of applicants who've completed applications ha has grown. There's some oscillations around here because of the way applications are done now, because of the way particularly that out-of-state tuition has evolved in this, uh, in this university now, not being as, um, uh, as good a buy. For, for some of our out-of-state students and so forth. So that, that goes on, but of course, um, the number of new freshmen, or I'll call them new first-year students, continues to go up, and this year, of course, at the highest level it has been. Um, the, the mix of the incoming students, of course, has been changing, has been changing and fairly dramatically Recently, as you can see, that the uh, white student population is, uh, is, is dropping, has been dropping for a while and dropping more significantly. The number of women has come up uh, significantly, roughly about 32%, and in terms of absolute numbers, the largest. Um, sort of flattened a little bit in terms of percentages, but as I said, in, ter in terms of absolute numbers uh, growing, and the uh, number of uh, students of color growing significantly now. Um, the, what we have celebrated over a number of years, certainly while uh, Steve was dean, was how things have changed with respect to uh, retention and graduation rates for students. And these have continued to grow. As you can see, the four-year graduation rate is uh, now quite high. Think about it, the difference between here and here. It's a, it's a huge difference, as you can see, on five-year graduation. And I understand we're, um, Paul, we're, we're, <laughs> we, we, we have the uh, highest, uh, second highest graduation rate in engineering, for example, in the public Big Ten schools after Michigan. So it's, it's a huge change in terms of how things have happened at the <laughs> University of Minnesota. So another great sign. And career outcomes, uh, not much has changed since a year ago. It still continues to be extremely strong. Uh, our students are in big demand or go to graduate school. And on occasion, some of them want to explore the world or, or the country. So they take a little bit of time off. Graduate trends, uh, roughly, um, 
uh, has continued to uh, go the direction we were going a year ago. Total enrollment is down uh, a bit, and it's highly affected particularly by number of master's students going down in, in a number of specialties, like electrical engineering. Um, international enrollments are down. Similarly, those go hand in hand. Together, um, the, the uh, women uh, are up slightly going in the right direction in that respect, and um, underrepresented minorities have been going slightly up recently as well, as you can see. Research, um, just, just the takeaway for, for the research side is that uh, things have been continued to go in the right direction. So research uh, awards, uh, excuse me, uh, research expenditures uh, this past year were up by about 3.5%, and the indirect costs were up even higher, which is really good news. <laughs> so, and, and that has to do with the mix of research grants to come, that come through, whether they're from state or not, or they're multi-institutional, and a lot of the funds have to go out and so forth. Um, and, and there is some data about the number of proposals that were submitted during the years, but those aren't quite as uh, informative, really, until we get the money in in a particular year. And uh, Chris will be putting out the latest numbers in terms of the annual intake of research uh, uh, very soon. So we can, we will be able to publicize that. All I can say is that that's good, too. That's good news, indeed. Whoops, what happened? And um, likewise, in terms of technology transfer, a lot of activities by our faculty and students and startups uh, happening, continue to happen. So that, that's, again, a good direction that has continued in the, in the college. Just give you a few, uh, just a couple of research examples. You can imagine a college like ours, we could spend maybe half a day or a day talking about all the great research that goes on in a college like that. So I had to pick just a couple of unusual examples. And so I, I'm showing you uh, two from grand challenges. So we have colleagues who have been involved in these multidisciplinary grand challenge projects. Uh, one, as you can see, led by um, Chris Doeng and Cara Santelli in Earth and Environmental Sciences together with um, on, on the tribal side, um, looking at environmental issues uh, related to uh, and uh, using uh, wild rice, um, um, manomin, if I say it right, manomin, uh, as, as, uh, as a way of measuring the in environmental impact in, in the lakes and rivers and places where wild, wild rice grows. So it's a very, very important. Um, a project, and it's one that really is important in our relationship with, the, um, um, with, with our tribal partners, very, very critical. Similarly, again, with indigenous populations, as you can see, the work that Dan Keefe in computer science and engineering has been doing with a number of other colleagues uh, in using technology, basically um, VR and other types of technologies to um, to, to look back and look in the future in terms of the history of these indigenous populations and um, where they have been and where they will be going in the future is my understanding. You notice that both of these uh, slides that I showed you had President Gable in, in them. So this, because during her inauguration, these were two projects that she actually participated in. Um, so that's... Uh, Great news. A, a few of, uh, of our uh, grants, major grants that have come in, again, just to show the diversity of the grants. It's not to, obviously anything like being even close to uh, being uh, inclusive and comprehensive. Congratulations to um, <clears throat> Mark Hillmeyer and his colleagues. Uh, it is difficult to, to get to have a very large research uh, center and have it uh, funded again, and, and uh, Center for Sustainable Polymers was um, funded once again, and that were a very, very critical um, subject and a very critical part of actually strategic 
you, you heard it, <laughs> strategic, strategic plans on environmental issues that are uh, discussed. Um, another one related to energy uh, is the ARPA-E grant that is listed here by Murti Salafika and uh, colleagues. A very interesting training grant involving many investigators from across the college, as you can see from multiple uh, colleges uh, related to essentially using data science uh, in the context of the multi-messenger astrophysics project. So we're, we're really uh, very excited about this one coming through. Um, another one, uh, a collaboration, Mitch Luskin and uh, Kay Wang in physics um, on novel superconductors. And of course, um, I, hypersonics is very hot right now in the government. All, all you have to look around is how much money the government keeps, keeps talking about investing hi, hypersonics. And we're fortunate to have what I think is the strongest computational uh, hypersonics program in the country. And so these are a couple of the uh, research grants that are related to that uh, area. Um, Getting into finances, not much that is really different in, in terms of how things have changed over the year. The amount has changed slightly up uh, from last year, but the, the split, the different uh, um, slices of the pie haven't changed much. They've basically changed by a percent between, for example, sponsored research and tuition and so forth. And we can look at that and what comes from the state. So not much new there. And similarly, in terms of allocations, um, our cost pool went up a little bit, as it turns out. But otherwise, things are more or less similar last year. So if, you, so if we look at uh, the way the uh, trajectory of these different sources of funds um, uh, are, you can see that, um, of course, the tuition, again, has uh, been going up rather steeply. And research um, has been going roughly up at a slower rate recently. It had gone up a lot more significantly before. And, uh, and the two sort of play out here. Last year, uh, one was below the other one slightly. And this year, it's the opposite. The research has picked up. All right. We're uh, in the final uh, year and a half, roughly, of, uh, of the Driven campaign. I'm sure you've gotten a lot of uh, um, notices about that. Um, the, the plan for the university, of course, has been $4 billion. That's the university's uh, campaign plan. And the college's goal well, has been $250 million. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, this. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> well, uh, over a, about a year and a half before the end of the campaign, we're already uh, over the, the goal. So that's, that's great news. And uh, as you can see, where the money has gone has been significantly to uh, student support, scholarships, faculty support, as you can see, and, and other areas. Um, what I do want to point out significantly, and thank you for so many of you who are in this audience for having contributed to this, is over at a nearly 900 faculty and staff have contributed over $15 million to the campaign. So thank you again. Another round of applause for yourselves. <laughs> And you can see what has come from our alumni and, uh, and uh, corporations and foundations and, um, and so forth. So we're extremely grateful. So the, once, <laughs> once you go up beyond what you had planned, uh, you get your committees together. We, had, we have a campaign committee for the College of Science and Engineering. And the decision was made to up the amount now to 285. So we have work to do, and, and uh, hopefully we'll beat this easily. <laughs> OK, some updates about facilities. Um, the big story, and we talked about this briefly last year, but now things are becoming a lot more real. Because our big project is, big capital project, is the Fraser Project, which is a chemistry instructional laboratory. The cost is huge. 
it's $98 million roughly, with about $65 million of that would be coming from, a, uh, from the state through a bonding request. And um, where we are with this, um, Dave, Chuck, and other colleagues in, in chemistry have been um, working very hard on this. Um, the, the university is collaborating with us, obviously. We've had a number of visits by members of the legislature, Senate, House, uh, the governor's office coming through um, uh, Smith Hall, looking at the Goldblum um, and so forth. And we'll look at some of those pictures shortly. And um, we're taking, making a case that this is really absolutely necessary investment by the university and the state. And, and of course, the college has to pay its fair service too uh, as part of this. So stay tuned. Um, we're, we're going to be getting into a full campaign mode with, with our advocates and so forth for this project. The other project uh, that has been getting a lot of time and planning is uh, plans for Lind Hall once the chemistry department, chemistry department, sorry, but once, once the English department moves out of Lind Hall um, and a couple of floors become um, free is, is for that part of Lind to become the future home of industrial and systems engineering and for some instructional facilities and offices for computer science and engineering, and of course, an upgrade of the Institute for Math and Applications, IMA, which we hope will be funded very soon. I keep fingers crossed. And, uh, and of course, some updates our student services in, in Lind Hall. The planning has been underway. Dave Papon has, has been spending a lot, a lot of time on this project, thank you. Dave, along with, of course, the heads and other members of the um, faculty in industrial and systems engineering and computer science and engineering. So this one uh, is planned to basically be covered by the college. So this will be a combination, roughly about $33 million. So this will be covered by some uh, existing funds plus an internal loan from the university. So this is going through its various approval chain processes. Uh, of course, we're waiting for uh, additional HIPAA funding to finish up the mechanical engineering uh, project and, and continue to uh, work on Vincent. And then in the future, if we can come up with additional funds, we should, is to continue to um, fix the rest of uh, Shepherd Lab for the college. Just a few pictures about chemistry. You can see not much has changed. It's the same lab, uh, 1930 to 2019. And, and David carries these pictures and shows it to all the legislators. You know, and some of them say, yeah, I remember going through that lab. <laughs> Cough. And, uh, and of course, the plan is to take Fraser, which is uh, across from Walter, on, on Pleasant and turn it into a um, 21st century uh, chemistry instructional laboratory with the labs all together, collaboration space. As, as David explains, uh, we don't teach chemistry like we did 100 years ago. I mean, it's very, very different the way the students um, do chemistry now in these uh, labs. So these are some of the drawings for the uh, uh, proposed lab. All right, we're coming to the end, so let me summarize a few um, updates. Well, first, happy birthday to a couple of our uh, programs. Uh, we've been celebrating the uh, centennial of chemical engineering program, the Jubilee of material science program, and just the, in a couple of days, we will have a big celebration of uh, computer science's Jubilee. So 50 years, so again, happy birthday to those programs. Uh, congratulations to uh, Department and School of Earth and Earth Science, which is now Earth and Environmental Science. So that took some doing, but it happened, uh, rightly so. And associated with some of those developments are some new programs, because now we have a, both a Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts degree in Environmental Geoscience. And, uh, and then the BS in data science, which I've mentioned before, is moving through the um, university. This obviously involves uh, multiple units, 
uh, both in the College of Science and Engineering as well as, for example, School of Statistics, which is in CLA. And the proposal for, for the program is currently under review by the Campus Curriculum Committee. So we should know soon, hopefully, where this is going. We, we wanted to show up in, at the Board of Regents, if possible, in December. I don't know if it will happen or not. In July, uh, we launched uh, a new institute, the Minnesota Robotics Institute. Uh, Nikos Papanikolopoulos is the founding director of the institute. The core budget for the institute comes from the MinDrive Robotic Sensors and Advanced Manufacturing. The main facility is in Shepherd in the Gemini, uh, Gemini Huntley Laboratory. And associated with the institute, there is a multidisciplinary MS in robotics which is working its way through university approval. So we hope it will be approved this December again by the board. Last year, I mentioned that um, our colleagues, there is this um, um, grassroots effort by some of our co colleagues and students in, in creating this um, group to, to, to the alliance, CSE, Diversity and Inclusivity, Alliance to improve the climate and um, sense of inclusion for, for the college and, and, and equity, of course. And the, um, the alliance has been amazing. It's what it's done in, in, in the one year that we've uh, been together. Um, so as you can see, there was a strategic planning retreat for the alliance in February. And then there was a major um, planning presentation and workshop this past October that President Gable opened, so critical. And, um, and also, among other things that the Alliance is doing, there is a committee that is working on a mission statement for the college that has embedded in it uh, diversity, equity, and inclus inclusion uh, as well. So stay tuned, because that has to come to the college as a whole eventually. Um, there's so many of you, so many of you who are here are involved in the Alliance. It's, uh, it's, it's been led by Edgar. Uh, I mentioned uh, received the uh, service award and Cara Santelli uh, in Earth and Environmental Sciences. As you can see, every department is engaged. And the engagement, and this is why I'm so proud of this program, the engagement is by everybody. It's students, faculty, postdocs, graduate, graduate uh, students, uh, and uh, staff, and uh, administrators. Uh, many department heads who are here are heavily engaged in the, in the effort. So overall, I expect that the number is over 211, but, but the last I had was 211 uh, champions for, for the program. So this is really very exciting development as well. So coming back to the growth of the college, remember that we talked about growing the cl incoming class by about 100 in each of the next three years. This is what we said last year. And, um, and this is what happened. So we proposed this growth to the university. They agreed to the plan. And, uh, but we needed to expand the capacity, I mentioned to you. $33 million just for the uh, LIND um, uh, fix up, if you wish. So, so we, needed, we needed resources. So last year, um, uh, we proposed a $1,000 per semester tuition surcharge for students coming into the college, undergraduate students coming into the college starting this fall. Uh, it was approved in February of 2019 by the Board of Regents, and um, the first group uh, came in, uh, increased by 137. So it was more than what we had planned. We had planned about 100, and we, came, we went over that. And what's interesting, and this is why I call them first-year students as opposed to freshmen, is because about 46% of them have advanced standing. So they're either sophomores, juniors, and in fact, three of them are seniors. Already, so that's changing the dynamics and of, uh, and the mix of what we do in the college, and the load that is on the college. So while the numbers have gone up like this, even with the incoming student, the overall enrollment in the college actually hasn't gone up much. So the total is about 41. 
which brings us again to what pays the bills, which is the tuition. <laughs> so this year, um, at least this fall, our tuition uh, picked up a little bit but from last year, but, but not much. As you can see, we're now at a level which is similar to essentially to 2014. So we're a bigger college, we're, we're, you know, bigger, bigger expenses, everything else, but um, we're actually not teaching in terms of student credit hours as, as much as we did in 2014, 2015. Obviously, it varies across departments. Some departments, like computer science, obviously, are teaching a lot more, and, and some, some have reduced. So this is something that is going to inform how this college is going to go forward in the future because the, the, this is really critical in terms of finances of the, uh, of the college. Now we do have the surcharge which is helpful but that surcharge is supposed to help us actually grow capacity. So fix laboratories, increase laboratories, uh, uh, give more experiential learning to the students, get some faculty and so forth. But um, it's, it's something, stay tuned, it's something that we're going to have to plan around. Okay, well, I'm done. Thank you, thank you again for your attention. Uh, as you can see, the slides, if you wanna look at details, are going to be posted at cse.umn.edu slash dean, and apparently there will be a video as well, in case you're interested. So thank you again for your attention. I, I have time, any of you who want to ask some questions, I'd be happy to do it. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So when you say a student comes in as a senior, I assume your statement is really that they're coming with 90 credits or whatever, not that they're going to be able to graduate in a year because they have to take all of these specific courses that we offer, right? Correct. Yeah. That is correct. Well, unless, as I, I mean, we've had students who've come in at age 11. <laughs> and, and I've been take, actually taking courses while they're supposedly in high school all the way through uh, even senior level. I've seen some <laughs> senior level uh, electrical engineering classes coming with a parent into the class. Um, so on occasion it does happen. Anything else? Well, let me, uh, yes. The question, with increase in enrollment, do you anticipate an increase in faculty? Well, that's the, uh, you, you saw the very last uh, slide. Obviously, an increase in faculty in programs that uh, have demand. That's, that's the way it's going to happen. But it has to be, overall, it has to be balanced with respect to the over, uh, the, our, our student credit hours. I mean, if, if that doesn't pick up so we can bring in the tuition to support it, unless we get some new, I mean, MinDrive helped us in a big way uh, by bringing in something outside of the tuition side to, um, to increase uh, at faculty. So things like that would, would certainly be helpful. I, I expect there will be an increase, but, but we have to see how this, this, this one plays out in terms of student credit hours. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you all again. Thanks for being here.